Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Alexander Meliagru Hitchens. I am the co-director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization. Um, and this is our one of our latest uh, report launch uh, written by our uh, research fellow, Julian uh, Belesh. The report's uh, title is Imagine Threats, Demographic Conspiracy Theories, uh, Anti-Semitism, and the Legacy of the Pittsburgh 2018 Synagogue Attack. We're really proud to do this report in partnership with the Program on Extremism at George Washington University, which I'm a research fellow at as well. And it's part of a kind of ongoing interest we both have uh, in uh, various manifestations of anti-Semitism and particularly how it acts as this sort of connective tissue between a lot of different extremist groups. Of course, it's an issue which has also come to the fore since October 7th. Of course, we are looking at a different source of anti-Semitism today. Um, but of course, it is all it is in many of our minds. Um, at what just a bit of uh, housekeeping uh, for those online, um, we will we invite you to uh, add questions in the Q and A. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q and A box. You feel free throughout the presentation uh, to put your questions in, and I will make sure uh, to read them out to Julian when he, once he's finished with his presentation. Uh, go ahead, Julian. Thank you. So, one second, I will just share my screen first. Um, all right, can you see the slides? Yeah. Yeah, all good. Thanks, Julian. All good? Okay, great. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us online. Uh, I'm happy to present the report I wrote uh, for the fifth anniversary of the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in the history of the United States, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, during which white supremacist Robert Bowers opened fire and killed 11 worshippers, injuring seven others. So this report looks at the legacy of the attack, its influence on subsequent terrorist attack and its impact on extreme right communities online. But it also gives a little perspective to the Tree of Life attack by looking at the motivational foundation of the shooting. Especially, it highlights the role demographic conspiracy theories, such as the white genocide or the great replacement theories played in shaping the attacker's social reality and the figures of and the figure of Jews as an imagined threat for white people. So, I will open this presentation with a short overview of the attack. Uh, I will then expand on demographic conspiracy theories a little bit. What are they, and where are they from, and also how they influence power social reality. I will then move on to the influence the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting had on subsequent terrorist attacks elsewhere. And finally, I will explain ways in which Bowers and his attack continue to be referenced and glorified in extreme right communities online. So let's go back five years ago. On October 27th, 2018, a Saturday morning, Robert Gregory Bowers, a resident of the state of Pennsylvania in the United States, entered the Tree of Life synagogue carrying several weapons and opened fire at worshippers who had gathered for Shabbat prayer one of the most important ritual observances in Judaism. During the attack, he reportedly shouted, all, Jew, all Jews must die, as he opened fire. He engaged in a firefight with the police as they arrived and was injured several times after which he surrendered. He killed 11 people and injured seven others that day, as I said, and he was sentenced to death in August uh, 2023. So Bauer's profile and online records, which emerged in the days after the attack, revealed Bauer's white supremacist convictions and his obsessive hate toward Jews. In custody, he reportedly told the law enforcement officer that Jews were committing genocide to white people, showing endorsement of demographic conspiracy theories. So what are demographic conspiracy theories? Uh, they are known under various labels, such as the white genocide, great replacement, Kalegi plan, but they are all based on the same underlying logic. These narratives claim that ethnic, religious, or national groups are under threat of eradication by outsiders due to demographic changes. But these demographic changes are the result from plots instigated by diverse sets of actors. So these are not 
conspiracy theories in which the conspirators are accused of enslaving or controlling a certain group, but they are accused of actively planning its destruction. These theories became increasingly central in far-right discourse, especially in recent years. So what I try to do in the first section of the report is to go back in history and trace that development in the far-right in the West to sort of clarify the commonalities and differences between these theories. So I elaborate uh, on them in more detail in the report, but I will try to summarize the main points here. So first, it's important to know that uh, demographic conspiracy theories did not appear with white genocide or great replacement, but they rely on discourses of fear of cultural and ethnic eradication that emerged mainly in France and the United States between the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And over the years, these discourses evolved and shaped alternately the figure of Jews, Muslims, immigrants, and progressive forces as essentialized collectives plotting the eradication of white people and Western cultures. So in France, in the end of the 19th century, uh, nationalist figures, Edouard Brumont and Maurice Barres, portrayed Jews as the ultimate enemy, the cause of all of France's problem, accusing them of invading France's elite and culturally overpowering the country from within. In short, they were accused of plotting the destruction of the country. So while the French framed the threat mostly in terms of invasion and substitution, the American strain emerged in a much different uh, context, a context of institutional segregation in the Jim Crow era, uh, a context of fear of unregulated social contact between black people and white people. So it therefore mainly focused on race mixing. So especially Madison Grant, a eugenicist, wrote in, in 1916, The Passing of the Great Race, in which he argued that the white Anglo-Saxon were heading towards annihilation, among other things, because of race mixing with the immigrants. So Grant advocated for complete racial segregation to prevent what he viewed as a contamination uh, by what he viewed again as inferior races. So Grant's book found admirers in the American elite, but not only, uh, it also had an important influence on Adolf Hitler who called the book his Bible in a, a, a letter he sent to Grant. And this was later reflected uh, in Hitler's obsession for race purity and the survival of the Aryan race. But in Hitler's imaginary, Jews were the primary existential threat. Uh, he viewed them as an invasive, ubiquitous power determined to eradicate what invaded. So German would never, uh, would always be in danger until they defeated that imagined Jewish power. And after the war, neo-Nazi revisited that imaginary. In France, René Binet accused the Zionists, uh, the embodiment of an imagined Jewish power of orchestrating uh, the genocide of white European by race mixing at, in, as early as December uh, 1948. And in the US in the 70s, the former American Nazi party, the National Socialist White People's Party described the implementation of desegregation buses, busing policies in terms of genocide and race murder by race mixing. And they, of course, accused Jews of standing behind that genocidal enterprise. So while neo-Nazis focused on Jews, other elements in the French far right, uh, in the far right in the West, sorry, focused on immigration, uh, which they viewed as an existential threat. For instance, the French Euro-Nationalist Europe Action opposed Algerian immigration to France in the 60s out of fear of race mixing, saying that like systematic race mixing is nothing but slow genocide, I quote. And discourses of replacement also emerged in post-war mainstream politics in the West. In 1968, former health secretary of the UK, Enoch Powell, delivered his infamous Rivers of Blood speech, in which he claimed that immigrants and the descendants will occupy part of the UK by the end of the 20th century and will eventually cause, to the, cause the collapse of the country. So from the mid 80s, these discourses of fear of cultural and ethnic eradication began to produce labeled demographic conspiracy theories, which are known today under various names. So I will very quickly go over the main ones. Uh, the first is the white genocide theory, which was developed by white supremacist and neo-Nazi David Lane in 1988 in his white genocide manifesto. Uh, in Lane's view, Jews stand behind a plot to eradicate white people. He accused Jews of controlling world government, imposing race mixing and promoting homosexuality, which he believed would annihilate white people over time. 
Another theory is called Eurabia, uh, which was produced by Batia O, a British Swiss author who was born in Egypt to European Jewish parents. She claimed in 2005 to have uncovered a plot to turn Europe into Eurabia, an imagined reality in which Muslims subvert the continent. She argued that European institutions and Arab League states plot the alleged Islamization of Europe. And here she argued that Europe, that Muslims are bearing an unchangeable culture that they cannot integrate and that they will uh, eventually lead to the collapse of the continent. The same year, Austrian Holocaust denier and neo-Nazi Gerd Hanzig claim in a book the existence of a Kalergi plan to destroy Europe, a plan he argues that was originally developed by Richard von Kuden of Kalergi, an Austrian Japanese politician and early promoter of European integration. Here again, he claims that the conspiracy was orchestrated by Jewish elites and included a combination of mass immigration and race mixing campaigns to eradicate white European. A few years later, in 2011, French writer Renaud Camus coined the term great replacement to describe the alleged massive invasion of immigrants on French territory. So in Camus' writing, Jews are no longer the primary concern. Instead, it's the figure of Muslims and African immigrants that embodied a threat of disappearance by replacement. And that is made possible thanks to the complicit silence of progressive forces, which he calls replaces elites. Finally, in South Africa, Demographic conspiracy theories related to violence against white farmers have emerged when website reporting on these attacks uh, began to label them as genocide, often suspecting governmental involvement in these acts. And this theory particularly resonated in white supremacy circles, where the, this year of white rule in South Africa and, Zim and Zimbabwe are still viewed with nostalgia. And there, that theory spurs uh, racial anxiety by describing uh, what happens when a white majority is ruled by a non-white, by a white minority is ruled by a non-white majority. So let's move on to the uh, second section of the report, looking at Robert Bauer's online discourse. Uh, there, I deconstructed uh, Bauer's discourse online to see how demographic conspiracy theories play out and influence his perception of social realities. So basically since January, 2018, Bowers created an account on the social media uh, platform Gab, uh, a popular flat platform in extreme right circles. And over the 10 months uh, before the attack, he shared hundreds of posts full of antisemitism and demographic conspiracy belief. And the archive of his activity online actually provides a great insight into his social world. So the idea here was to break down uh, Bauer's conspiratorial perceptions of reality. And I divided it uh, into three main themes. Uh, the first is the representation of Jews as a ubiquitous evil power. The second is the demographic threat of immigration. And the last one is the figure of Jews as a neighbor of death via immigration. So throughout his feed, uh, there are manifestations of conspiratorial antisemitism, representing Jews as an evil and ubiquitous power governed by an imagined essence which commands them to wage war against white people. For example, in his bio section, uh, he paraphrased a Bible verse saying that Jews are the children of Satan and claims that Jews were inherently hostile to non-Jews. Now, it's important to note that like this association of Jews with mythical evil figures is central to the process of antisemitic essentialization. Uh, it establishes Jews as responsible for humanity's problems and turn the fight against them into a sacred duty. But Bowers did not only identify Jews as essentially evil, he also assigned them supernatural power and the capacity to achieve their will. One example that illustrates this is this one, uh, a, mem a meme entitled The Illusion of Free Choice. It represents the political spectrum of the democracy as a, as a maze with two entrances, one's marked right, the other left, but both entrances lead to the figure of the happy American, an anti-Semitic caricature representing the figure of Jews that control society uh, behind the scene. And in another example, Bowers uh, shared on Gab shows Donald Trump, who was then US president, apparently talking with a religious Jewish man. 
and the Jewish man is giving Trump instruction, commanding that, commanding him to appear as a white racist in order in order to keep white people under Jewish control. So now, his online activity also showed his concern with the imagined prospect of white race disappearing in America due to the introduction of non-white populations in the country. For example, uh, in a post, he he expressed uh, uh, his opposition to the idea of diversity, which he viewed as a path toward, gen toward the genocide of white people. You can see here that he says that diversity means chasing down the last white person. And in another post, he expressed his satisfaction at seeing people calling uh, migrant invaders. So in Bauer's social world, uh, the conjunction of that ubiquitous evil Jewish power on the one hand, with the existential threat of, immigra of immigration in the other, established Jews as the enablers of the threat of eradication. He therefore portrayed Jews as the promoters and organizers of immigration to the US, and particularly focused on the Hebrew Immigrants Aid Society, HIRES, a Jewish American nonprofit organization. And through that, his feed, he depicted Hayes as the visible side of the Jewish plot to eradicate white people, the structure that facilitates the introduction of little bodies into the country. For instance, this example showed a picture of a woman holding an highest poster saying she supports refugees because she is Jewish. And two weeks before the attack, Bowers posted a link to the highest website listing Jewish congregations that were hosting events in support of refugees. And that list included the Dochadash Jewish congregation, which is hosted at the Tree of Life Synagogue of Pittsburgh. Finally, the, his last post, the day of his, of his attack, also blamed Hayes once again for breaking hostile invaders before he went on to commit his attack. Uh, and that last sentence he posted, screw your optics, I'm going in, still resonate in extreme right circles today, as we will see later, we'll get back to it. So let's move on to the third section and the influence of uh, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting on extreme right terrorism. Uh, Bauer's attack did help inspire other white supremacist terrorist attack, and especially three subsequent attackers cited Bowers as an example and a role model. The first one is John Ernest, the poet synagogue attacker in 2019 described Bowers as a source of inspiration. In May 2022, the Buffalo shooter Peyton Gendron listed Bowers among individuals that, I quote, take a stand against ethnic and cultural genocide. A few months later, in October 2022, Juraj Prashtek, the perpetrator of the Bratislava LGBTQ plus bar shooting, included Bowers in the list of people he viewed as heroes and role model in a tweet. Now, all three posted manifestos online. They were all full of anti-Semitism and demographic conspiracy belief. Uh, they also cited white supremacist terrorists as example and role models. But despite all these similarities, uh, they chose of target diff uh, different. Um, so while Ernest, like Bowers, targeted the synagogue, gender chose to attack a grocery store in a predominantly black area. Krashtik, on the other hand, attacked an establishment frequented by the LGBTQ plus communities. Uh, and I think that these differences illustrate what unites this attack. The conspiratorial belief that they stand in defense of the white race against a plot to eradicate it. So this section dissects uh, their manifesto and assesses Bauer's influence on their views and action. And here, anti-Semitism is key in connected these attacks. All three manifestos display violent conspiratorial anti-Semitism, uh, but they did not assign the same role and importance to Jews in the imagined threat that they, the, for white people that they describe. So Ernest, similarly to Boris, again, viewed Jews as essentially evil accused them of conducted genocide of white people, but he also viewed Muslims as essential evil, although he viewed them as a secondary evil. And as he said, I quote, useful puppets for the Jews in terms of replacing the whites. For Jedron, the Buffalo shooter, it was quite the opposite. He accused Jews of being responsible for the ongoing genocide of white people, but he believed they could be dealt with later. 
The most pressing danger for him was the immigrants whom he called replacers and went on and attacked uh, uh, African, uh, African American community, which he viewed as immigrants. Finally, Crash Tech also accused Jews of plotting the eradication of white people, but viewed them as promoters of homosexuality, transness, and other sexualities he believed would undermine the existence of white people. So basically in this section, what I see is that power's influence exists primarily within on, on these, on, on these uh, subsequent attacks, exists primarily within a broader system of white supremacist conspiratorial belief, which views white people as the victims of diverse plot to eradicate them by demographic changes. And that sort of laid the ground for a loose network of distinctive terrorist attack in which the different attackers can have slightly different conspiratorial conviction and target, but all share the same objective and praise one another for their commitment and their sacrifice for the cause. So in the fourth and final uh, section and last section of the report, I looked at the figure of Robert Bauer in extreme right uh, online communities. I conducted an ethnography online over July and August on a range of social media platforms, mostly Telegram and 4chan, to determine ways in which Bowers and his attack continue to be referenced and glorified there. So there it's interesting to note first that Bowers' influence remained relatively uh, limited. Uh, among the, for example, among the seven manifestos uh, that were posted following attacks that took place after the Tree of Life shooting, only Ernest and Gendron uh, document present positive mentions of Bowers. And in both cases, Bowers appears in fewer references than other attackers. And Krashnik, he did not even mention uh, uh, Bowers in his own manifesto, although he did call him a uh, hero and role model in the tweet. So the reason for this are difficult to pinpoint really, but I think it's possible that the, the, the absence of manifesto and the relatively limited number of visuals of Bowers that emerged online after the attack that helped, I mean, that contributed to sort of limit his influence. But anyway, this ethnographic research demonstrates that Bowers still appears at times in glorifying reference in extreme white communities online. Uh, among these references, screw your optics, I'm going in. Uh, the last word Bowers posted on uh, on Gap before his, uh, before his attack became a popular motto in extreme right social media. Uh, representation of Bowers also circulates online via memes, uh, and he was also represented as a saint in neo-fascist -mili neo militant accelerationist channels. So, so let's begin with the uh, the reference to to optics. So that is a reference to an ongoing debate within the racist alt right concerning how best to convey its political message and attract new recruits. And actually, both by dismissing that optics debate, established violence as the only way forward to save white people from that imagined annihilation. And that phrase became very popular in extreme right online and quite quickly. Uh, it was already used by many on the poll board of 4chan, the politi politically incorrect board of 4chan by January 2019. Uh, it was also used in visual celebrating Bowers, uh, just an example here, but there are, there are many. Uh, you can see here Bowers uh, uh, portrayed with laser eyes in a hyper stylized manner, uh, holding an assault rifle and dressed in military equipment. And the quote was also used by other far-right figures who uh, used it to promote their own activity, for example, their own activities. For example, Austrian neo-Nazi rapper Mr. Bond produced an, an, an album entitled Free Optics, I'm Going In, in 2019, which is full of anti-Semitic song. And, and representation of Bowers, so as I said, are also disseminated in extreme white community online via memes that use humor and irony to portray Bowers and his action in a positive light. Uh, for example, a meme that, that emerged on 4chan uh, ironically presents Bowers as the pole champion winning a competition called Gas, the K-word with the top score, 
Uh, another meme appear, who, that appeared on 4chan as well, showing a screenshot of an apparent news article entitled, Going to Synagogues Makes You Happy, a Pew Study Find. And below the title, you can see a picture of the interior of the Great Synagogue of Budapest in Hungary, with a portrait of uh, Bowers appearing on it. Finally, Bowers was also anointed as a saint in neo-fascist militant acceleration circle, uh, that same culture aimed to incite violent action by glorifying at attackers as martyrs. Uh, so over time, visuals of Bowers as a saint appear online, such as this one based on Nicolas Tournier's painting, Saint Paul, which originally depicted the holy man holding a scroll. It was edited to uh, represent Bowers in place of Saint Paul, with the sun and as, as a as a halo, a dark, a, a dark, a black, a dark sun, as a halo above his head. Uh, in the scroll, you can see screw your optics appearing uh, in Gothic later letters. So since 2021, uh, that culture became increasingly structured, and propagandists began producing monthly calendars marking various milestones, such as dates of attacks or attackers' birthday. Uh, here you can see uh, this month's uh, October 2023 calendar on the date of the attack, uh, Boris appears 27th of October. But they also created same card to commemorate uh, past attacks and past attackers, which includes uh, details such as summaries of attacks, method, death tolls, and other pictures. So basically that same culture uh, ensured for Bowers moments uh, to be referenced and glorified in extreme white communities online, and especially around October 27th, the, death, the, the date of his uh, terrible attack. So to conclude, uh, in this presentation, I looked at the motivational foundations of the Three of Life Synagogue attack. I highlighted the role demographic uh, conspiracy theories played in it, I looked at the history and how they helped shape Bauer's social reality. I explored the influence of the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting on subsequent attacks. And finally, I explained ways in which Bauer's continues to be celebrated in extreme right communities online. So that's it for me. Uh, I'm happy to take any question now. Thanks so much, Julian. You can go ahead and uh, stop sharing your screen as well. Um, yeah, that was really an excellent rundown. Um, and of course, you know, <clears throat> I forgot to note at the beginning that uh, the reason we are releasing the report uh, today is, is that it is, uh, well, tomorrow is the uh, fifth anniversary of the attacks. Um, so it seemed like the right time to uh, look back and, and get a sense of, of, of its legacy. Um, so just to remind uh, everyone uh, on the call, uh, we, there's an open Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom page or Zoom uh, pane. So do go ahead and uh, put your questions in there. I have a couple, uh, one myself, and then there's a couple in the in the Q and A box already. Um, sure. So one of the things that uh, kind of distinguishes, I suppose, Bowers is that he didn't produce. I think I'm right in saying he didn't produce a manifesto, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is something that really characterizes right wing mass shootings, particularly since um, Anders Breivik. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, manifesto plays a big role in, in as a motivator in, in a kind of way that it doesn't quite in the same way for say jihadist terrorism. So I just wondered what you thought about. You know, did you get a sense of why um, there was no manifesto? Do you think that it has impacted his influence? I mean, clearly, he, you know, not having a manifesto didn't has not stopped him from uh, having an influence on extreme right communities um, online. So I just wondered what you thought about one. Why do you think is it? I mean, a hard one to answer, I suppose. Why he didn't do one, and why do you think that he still managed to have this influence despite not not writing a manifesto? Um, well, I think I think I think first of all that you totally right saying that like these manifestos uh, actually help uh, 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 linking the attackers to a broader memory. Uh, this is where they actually explain what they're going to do and why they did what they've done. And this manifesto became very central in commemorating uh, these past attackers and promoting the images uh, uh, online and elsewhere. I It's hard to know why he didn't do one. I think that like his uh, records on Gap sort of, uh, uh, at least as I see it, are used as one in a way but you can't say really 
why he did what he's done besides trying to understand uh, uh, his the underlying reasons of his attack based on a, 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 a discourse analysis of of his uh, online activity, which is which consists mainly in post he reposted and reshared, so showing how he probably perceived his reality. Uh, I do think that like these manifestos create some sort create almost a form of intimacy between people who support uh, that kind of attack and the attackers. Uh, it, it makes you. I did that on the third section, like reading all these manifestos. You 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 really get the feeling in the end that you know these people better a little bit, and I think that sort of imagined proximity uh, uh, contribute to uh, maybe. Uh, uh, to the popularity online in extreme wide sphere, that makes sense. No, yes, thank you. Uh, and we've had a few questions just asking about accessing the report. Um, it is available online now, and you can get on our website, icsr.info, or you can visit our Twitter page, uh, icsr underscore center. Um, so a couple of questions from, from the audience. Uh, how do you see, given that you've kind of given this uh, historic overview of how of these kind of demographic conspiracy theories and how they've evolved and particularly evolved really the more the kind of more recent evolution was the term white genocide to great replacement and has added components to it uh, do you have any thoughts on um, and i know you don't really cover this in the report but do you have any thoughts on how these demographic conspiracies theories may uh, evolve in the coming years are there are there things that you think we should should be looked out for uh, how they might evolve, I, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, what's important, I think, is that they, they these uh, demographic conspiracy theory emerge primarily from from uh, within the far right, and they are particularly powerful uh, in white supremacy circle and extreme white circle because they are based on these ideologies are obsessed with racial survival, inherently violent. And these conspiracy theories come to tell you not that someone is trying to uh, 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 you know, enslave you or control you, but it, they're basically killing you right now. You need to react quick if you want to survive. So they sort of provide the needs for white supremacy to create that imagined reality that uh, white supremacy uh, needs to thrive. So they can take many forms and shapes, but I think what's important there is to understand uh, uh, how they function. Uh, there might be uh, uh, new ones coming up in the future. It's quite hard to know how they uh, will, uh, uh, what shape and what form they will take. Some of them are more about uh, race mixing and are more racist in a way. Other ones talk more about like cultural replacement, like the Great Replacement or Ono Kemi. Can we talk only in terms of, of cultural subversion? Uh, what I can say, though, following these channels is that like they are very central to uh, extreme right discourse today. And I would not be surprised if the, the interplay between ideology and conspiracy theories will in the future lead to more violence. But they can take different shape and form. Yeah, just to build on that. Um... Something that we're thinking we're thinking about is not necessarily how how they'll evolve, though that is important. But also just looking at how these narratives adapt and react to realities on the ground and in situations. So you know all these you know powerful conspiracy theories that drive terrorists today, for example, war on Islam for the jihadists, great replacement for the extreme right. There are facts on the ground that they can exploit to prove this conspiracy theory. And you know, for example, it might you know. Um, monitoring of extremist reactions for example since october 7th a lot some of the more extreme kind of telegram pages you see arguments that actually this has been manufactured by israel uh in order to justify a bombing campaign in in Pal in, in gaza uh in order to actually encourage further migration into europe of muslims so they actually you know this is intentionally kicking palestinians out in order to uh, get them into Europe and, and to grow the, you know, this, the, 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 the amount of Muslims coming into the West and replacing so-called indigenous populations. So what you see is more, in, what's worth keeping an eye on is how do they adapt and react to, to, to yeah, major absolutely. events. Um, just a, uh, another question here. Um, uh, quite a few actually. Thank you. Um, 
uh, sorry, I'm just going to read a few here. Um, I think one, yeah, one of the interesting ones is someone pointed out that Bowers has made use to refer to biblical verses. Uh, and yeah. I think the question kind of was around your view on the role Christianity played, perhaps for him and generally for uh, this type of extremism. Did you get a sense of that? Uh, so it depends. It very much depends on the case. I can say that, like in terms of like the verse he 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 he's used, and he has used as part of his uh in the, his bio section, uh is is basically taken out of context. Uh and uh and experts on Christianity say that that's not what is intended intended when these words were written and so on. Uh, I know that Ernest. Uh, who attacked the, the Chabad of Powe in 2019? His manifesto is 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 very clearly tainted with with Christianism. He accused Jews of of having uh, killed uh, Jesus and so on, and he uh, defines himself as a chosen Christian. And he, but it's again, it very much depends. There's this link between, uh, I mean, anti-Semitism can can harbor a more religious tone, but not all of them at all. Uh, in this case, it was mostly Ernest who was very clearly marked religiously. Uh, Bowers, it's even a bit less. He talked, there's only that verse, and then he doesn't talk about Christianity at all, at least not in his, uh, not, not on his online record. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that, and this is, this is particularly since the uh, Christchurch attack in uh, New Zealand, um, and the New Zealand government kind of taking this policy of not naming Brent Tarrant, the shooter, um, as an attempt to sort of uh, prevent him from, from becoming more influential and martyring him in, in other ways like that. Uh, so the question kind of was around you know, what your view is on not naming. And do you think the New Zealand government uh, made the right choice? I mean, of course, we have named the shooter in, in, the, in the report, Robert Bowers. So obviously we have taken a certain view on it. But uh, did you have any thoughts on... Uh, calls to not name shooters like this, do you think it would make a difference? Um, personally, I think as experts, I, can, I mean, at least as scholars, we have to name them because we need to know what we're studying and we need to know uh, uh, what... We basically need to understand these people better and naming them. So I, I do understand the argument of uh, not wanting to give them the publicity they want. Uh, on the other hand, it's also places where that you would sort of, uh, how can I say, maybe uh, not talking about them create a sort of gray area where you don't know what's happened behind the veil. You know what I mean? So I I, I, I do think that at least as scholars, we must uh, name these people, look into their lives, look into their habits, wherever, whatever source of information we can get. Uh, from uh, or bio biographical details that we can get to help us understand why they did what they did and what they thought, what they saw better. Uh, but but I, I do I do hear the argument. Yeah. Um, yes, I think you know as, as of course we've taken a position on it by naming him. Um, my own view as well is that yet yeah, on the whole. The, the public should be treated as much as possible as grown-ups and be given all the information as possible. And the other thing to keep in mind with conspiracy theories is that they, they thrive uh, when there's no transparency. They thrive when there's no information, especially when the government is withholding information. Um, so and it, accusations of false flags, of the government doing it themselves, would only be strengthened by, by this attempt to sort of hide the name of some. It's also just impractical if you read... The, new, the very good New Zealand government official report on on Tarrant and the attack in Tarrant's life, it's basically a biography of a guy that they don't name throughout the whole time. They name his family, they name his parents, and they just don't name him. And it just becomes, just kind of ends up looking a little bit silly. Um, but, you know, I can respect the desire, especially by victims, victims' families, not to name people like this. So we can see, we can understand it, uh, but we have taken a, a specific position on that. Um, and just, I think... One of the other questions kind of relates to, uh, you know, you've named quite a few shooters now. I mentioned also Tarrant and Brevik. Uh, we are, you know, there is an uptick in this type of violence, particularly the mass shooting style, even outside of the United States. We're seeing people getting access to weapons and allowing them to, to commit uh, shootings. Um, 
do you have any sense of is this a about the timing of this you know why uh, are we seeing an apparent acceleration of this type of violence now is there, is there something that's pushing uh, these individuals over the edge from this kind of online extremism to actually acting do you get a sense of of of, of why this is happening now um I think that the discourse that sort of push them out uh, are very well, uh, uh, they are very much in place online in these communities and they have uh, spaces where they can actually exchange meat uh, and, and yeah, being inside of uh, those violence uh, on a regular basis. Uh, now there were always, I mean, that's, there were that sort of attacks like already in the past. Uh, now you have uh, in the United States there are more than elsewhere because as you as you noted, uh, it's easier to to get the means to conduct your action. I'm I'm not sure what would happen in Europe if it was as easy to buy an M16. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's linked to broader political question. The state of our societies that that fuel and feed uh, 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 grievances that in the end find themselves uh, in these channels. Thanks. Um, Emma asks, uh, you mentioned that things have become more structured. So this is kind of linked to the previous question. It's become more structured like the saints culture, the calendar yeah. that you showed <clears throat> since 2021. Um, and the question is, why do you think that is? And what other sort of precursors to violent action do you think we could see especially given the situation in Israel. Well, what's sorry? The second question I didn't hear. What uh, why do you uh, why do you think that they've uh, that we've seen this more structured uh, saints culture mm -hmm. and creation of these calendars, but also what other kind of precursors to violent action do you think we could see? Uh, uh, is first it possible all, essentially to see it come is it possible to identify through online activities for example, you know, something like Yeah. in is it possible to have a more structured way of even identifying that. Okay, so first, the, the first question is that these people, propagandists, especially in uh, neo-fascist militant accelerationist channel, they're very committed, they're very active online, they always find, uh, they always look for new ways uh, to, to sort of uh, structure the propaganda and to uh, promote their content. Uh, they always try to, 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 to keep uh, uh, the connections with their follower alive, notably that 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 thing about the saint calendars is a way also of pacing the life of followers a little bit like uh, religious rituals do. You know, when you have like every day it's a moment of remembrance to help you connect with a broader identity, and that helps sort of strengthening uh, that collective identity through uh, 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 shared dates and moments. Uh, of celebration uh so they're always trying to do that and the more they do that as long as platforms allow them to uh sort of develop uh their channels uh they always come up with new uh designs they always uh, try to 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 basically produce uh professional content that look good that people can identify with and if and as and the longer they stay the the the, the the more time they have to gather new followers. So that's one thing. And the second question, <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Are there, uh, are there ways, do you, given that you kind of analyzed his activity prior mm -hmm. to his attack, yeah. do you think there are oh, in cases of a pre-attack? So that's very yeah. difficult. That's very difficult because what I can say is that uh, uh, Bauer's uh, activity is not too different from many things I see in these spaces anyway, where it could have been done differently. What could have been done is that two weeks before when he posted uh, a list of uh, of highest, from highest website listing the congregation that hosts events for refugees, uh, this is a moment where it, it became real. Uh, you have addresses, potential targets, and then that person should have entered some some sort of radar. Same with like, uh, you know, co clear call for violence, etc. But even before that, long before that, he posted uh, uh, pictures of the gun he bought uh, in the past few years. But 
again, that's legal. He had an active, like an active uh, uh, gun license that we know. Uh, so there's nothing that could have been done uh, uh, on that matter. But the moment where he posted addresses, I think, is the moment where where things could have been uh, prevented. Great, thanks. And actually, I should note on that question of kind of pre-attack behaviors, which is a very important one, and particularly mm -hmm. a lot of, I think, uh, technology companies are, are kind of interested in learning more about. Uh, a separate project we run at ICSR called the Global Network on Extremism and Technology uh, is looking at this, and we're actually about to publish a report specifically on pre-attack behaviors of far-right shooters uh, by uh, Julia Cooper and uh, Jay Reed Malloy. So for those of you who follow ICSR already, you will have seen uh, the release uh, the invitation to attend the event and, and the date of the report release. So do keep an eye out for that. Um, there's also a question, again, I know you don't quite cover it in the report, so you may not have too much information on it, but about Bowers himself, the kind of other factors, you know, if we think about someone's radicalization process, did you get any, do you have any sense of, you know, other factors in his life uh, that may have influenced uh, his, his decision making here? Um, so factors, we don't know, we don't have too many details about him, but I can tell you a bit more about uh, his life. His father uh, was uh, sentenced uh, to prison for rape charges. Uh, he had a difficult childhood that I know. Uh, he worked as a truck driver for some time. Uh, and his journey was more coming from uh, the right of the right of conservatism in America. Uh, moving towards uh, white supremacy. I know that in the early 2000s, uh, 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 he was the archivist of John Quinn's uh, The War Room program. Uh, uh, but from January 2018, when he opened and he created his Gab account, he was, I mean, based on the archive I was able to access, he was, he was already clearly a white supremacist. So there, there's still a gray uh, zone, in which I don't really know uh, what really motivated his journey. We, we still lack information about money. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there's, there's never one path, you know, and if people may make something of the fact that he had a bad childhood, his father was in prison, of course, he's likely to have an impact. But of course, we have plenty of other examples of people who had relatively normal and happy upbringings who still end up doing stuff like this. So, it's important to know these things, but also not to place so much importance on them because it can be quite difficult to to parse out uh, those type of how those experiences can end up um, pushing people in these directions. Um, we have time for a couple more questions if people wanted to add some more in. Uh, there's one here from uh, Maddie, which is um, this is kind of related more to the, your experience uh, as a researcher on these issues. And I think one of the things that, again, uh, we at ICSR have uh, discussed and 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 uh, researched and written about, uh, which is the kind of impact that uh, accessing and you know constantly being exposed to these type of very extreme uh, materials online can have on on the researcher. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you have? Did, uh, were there any? You know, again, you know, be as. Uh, you know, as, as open or not as you want about this, is these are this is a personal experience and question for every every researcher. Some are affected more than others, and you know that's that's just how how it kind of pans out. But um, I guess were there any strategies or ways that you? I mean, did you find that you were affected by by you know exposure to this stuff? And if so, or you know, what steps did you take to minimize that? Or did you take steps before even you you were feeling any any issues to, that you know perhaps well, safeguarded first you? First of all, I. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think I think I think it's a it's a it's a really important uh, uh, reflection we, we should all have dealing with these issues. Uh, and and the, the answer is yes, of course. I think that uh, I've been working in this space for for a few years now, spending a lot of time in these networks. I, I I think that like if you don't feel anything when you see these things, maybe this is the moment where you can say, oh, something in me is a bit uh, sick in a way. Uh, it's important to look at that in the eye and saying in the eyes and say, okay, yeah, uh, it has an impact on me, and it does. I think it depends uh, on 
the attacks and the type of things that I've seen, if it's something that is closer to home, it's it, it hurts much more and I can identify with the place, with the people, with the... Uh, uh, but uh, what I'm trying to do in general is trying to uh, not spend too much, uh, too many hours in a row watching that type of content. Trying not to open the videos or the or the things that I see will be something that I non need to see. And when I do, I try to watch them. It will sound funny, but to watch them without any sound, because I think that the sound makes it more alive. Uh, so I'm trying to 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 put as many virtual distances as I can from uh, the content itself in general. And I try, if I'm getting too anxious sometimes, I just don't do it for a couple of days, then get back to it, try to. But yeah, this is not an easy an easy space to, to research anyway. Yeah, that's all, those are all very healthy and, and good suggestions. And again, it's, uh, if you look on our uh, webpage, uh, you'll find that we've actually produced some materials giving advice, much of which Julian just actually reiterated there. Um, and I would, yeah, just second, the particular this that you, you don't have to watch those videos. Uh, you can be a researcher in this field unless you're doing your PhD on the kind of videography of a beheading or a mass shooting. Uh, you don't actually need to watch. There's really almost nothing to be gained uh, as a researcher from actually watching the real the murders and the killings. Um, and in fact, there's a lot to be lost from it from yourself. And and you're actually kind of kind of handing a win over to the people who created the materials. There are times where you have to watch it. Uh, depending on your work, but on the whole, you can be very successful researcher, academic analyst, never having watched any of it. And that, that so don't feel that you have to. Um, so the last question kind of relates to the accessibility uh, of these kind of materials. Uh, a lot of the work that you did to collect this was on, I believe, on Telegram uh, and, yeah. and Gab, was it? Um, just generally, what was your view on how easily accessible this stuff was or is? You know, was it very easily accessible? Were you surprised at how it continues to be? What is your take kind of on what Telegram looks like today for the extreme right? Um, first of all, I, I think it's it's too easy if you're asking me, uh, but I've been working in this space again for, for a few years, so I know where to find this stuff. Uh, I also used our database read, the one I'm, uh, I'm in charge to find the manifestos I needed. Uh, it was much easier uh, there. Uh, which is something I recommend for any researcher who wants to uh, 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 get primary resources easily and in a safe and uh, way. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, it was it, it was it, it was it was too too easy in my view, but it was not like uh, I just I, I I'm already in these spaces. I'm already in the channel, and Telegram uh, is very central. Uh, I think that the platform is, I can see that they're moderating a few channels here and there, but overall, the sort of, uh, yeah, overall, it's still working. Uh, people are far right, white supremacists don't need to go elsewhere. Sometimes the channel is closed, they open a new one that stays open. They also have backup channels in private channels and they just have to post all the content and that sort of thing. So yeah, Telegram is uh, is still to your question on how it moves. Yeah, um, again, yeah, my, that's similar to my own experience. And yeah, thank you again for actually reminding me about the the database that we also run that Julian is is, is running for us at ICSR. That is the uh, repository of extremist aligned documents. Read. Um, if you remind me the URL, if people want to sign up. Yeah, sure. And um, and this essentially is nice. again linked to the kind of safe access to primary sources that like preventing you know making sure that you don't necessarily have to go on telegram you don't have to go into the kind of dark corners of the internet to, to access a manifesto uh, there are safer ways to do it uh and we're part of we're trying to be part of you know giving people access safely to this stuff and the, the read database is, is part of that you know most extreme right primary sources you'd want would be available on that it's a registration based site um what's the url again uh, julian uh, the URL is, sorry, I'm yeah. read.expert. Uh, I can't write it in the No, no problem. The yeah, chat, fine. Yeah. Read.expert, R-E-A-D.expert. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everyone again. Uh, just to thank, thank again also our partners at the program on extremism at GWU. Um, if you want to follow up on our work at ICSR, it is icsr.info, our website. The uh, program on extremism URL is extremism.gwu.edu. Uh, the report, as I said, is available online right now. Um, and please feel free also to share your feedback and thoughts via email or uh, online, uh, via, on Twitter or social media. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining. Thank you.